welcome to the Global Philosophy of Religion Project at the University of Birmingham, led by Professor Eugen Nagazawa. We at Close to the Truth are pleased to participate. Chakravari Ram Prasad, fellow of the British Academy, is Distinguished Professor of Comparative Religion and Philosophy at Lancaster University in the UK. Ram, welcome. Let's explore the existence and nature of God or deities in the religious traditions that you've researched that have emerged on the Indian subcontinent. So let's begin by by giving an overview, and I know you've thought a lot about this, about how the various conceptions of the divine emerged in what we now call Hindu traditions, starting with the early Vedic materials and then the origins of what you described as systematic theological thinking. Right. So we could say the story begins uh, with the earliest uh, recorded materials that we have, which is in the Rig Veda, which was um, something that developed orally perhaps between uh, 1700 and 1200 BCE. Now, the Rig Veda is primarily given over to an account of a highly ritualized cosmos in which the interpretive activity of ritual by trained poet priests uh, sort of keeps the universe running on its ordered course. So it's primarily about the order of the universe and it has many narratives of um, deities most of them are representative of abstract ideas like thought and speech, the moon, the sun, the wind, and most of all, fire. And the narratives of these deities and their struggles with the forces of darkness, the asuras roughly translated as demons, takes up a kind of a mytho narrative of how the universal order um, is constantly under threat by disorder and constantly needs to be kept in order. But amidst all of this, you also have particular hymns which ask very profound questions about the nature of human existence. So the most famous of it in the 10th uh, chapter of the Rig Veda is called the Hymn to the Dark Beginning, which begins by asking, in the beginning, what was? And goes on to say, well, who knows? Perhaps only that which was there knows. Perhaps even that does not. So right at the beginning of this elaboration of ritual and narrative, you already have the beginnings of speculation about the outermost reaches of human thought. Now, the Vedas, of which there are four, and then they have bodies associated with them, which were all seen to have been composed by perhaps about the 4th or 5th century BCE, they're all seen as a revelation, not necessarily the revelation of a god, although some Hindu schools think that, but a kind of revelation of the structures of reality to the priests uh, in whose name they are said to, uh, you know, they, that they are associated with. So, the, what the texts are seen to represent, therefore, is this exploration of human consciousness at its outer reaches. The most significant development along these lines happens in a body of texts composed from about the 9th century BCE called the Upanishads. In the Upanishads, this quest for understanding why we are here, where we came from, who we are in relation to that reality, what explains the nature of existence as we find it, are all really pushed to their limits. And it is here that the Indian tradition begins to talk about the notion of Brahman from a root word meaning growth, from which things grow. And Brahman becomes the formal name for that which explains all else. And in the various Upanishads that are composed in the first millennium BCE, you have everything from a very abstract notion of 
a universal consciousness which sustains the world, all the way to Brahman being conceived of as a personal god, a god that intervenes in the affairs of the gods, the demons, and human beings. So right in that set of compositions, you have a huge range of possible ways of asking who it is or what it is that explains all else. Subsequent Hindu thought, in some way or the other, engages with queries, interrogates, or develops from this notion of Brahman that is found in the Upanishads. So in the Hindu traditions, I'm trying to articulate the approaches to God or deities with what we are normally familiar with in the West in the Judeo-Christian tradition. So can we ask what kinds of arguments have been advanced uh, in the Hindu tradition for the existence of God or deities? And in particular, you've articulated that there is an orthodox exegetical critique of different forms of theism, so that's interesting, different forms of theism, and then their subsequent impact on the development of what we would, I guess, call today Hindu philosophy of religion. Right. So what you have to keep in mind is that from the perspective of what happens uh, in uh, Greek thought in late antiquity and in um, Christianity, you have or indeed in how uh, these ideas develop and are discussed in Islam, say, the Hindu traditions are very, very different. As the Upanishadic um, ways of thinking in this sort of metaphysical and devotional way start coming to an end by perhaps the second century BCE, a very different set of narratives starts arising. Now, these are stories of um, all kinds of um, superhuman entities, all the deities. Some of them are those that are found in the Vedas. But you also see the development of one or two deities that are relatively minor in the Vedas, emerging increasingly as ways of conceiving of the supreme personal god or goddess. And compositions around the doings of, the, of this god or goddess in different texts from about the 2nd century BC to the 4th or 5th century BC clearly speak to the growth of popular ways of relating to that which is beyond our comprehension. By about the start of the Common Era, however, you see perhaps the text that is subsequently recognized, especially in the second millennium of the common era, as the place which brings together both the narratives of a personal God intervening in the cosmic order of men and that God as seen as ultimate, as being the focus of theological exploration. This is the Bhagavad Gita, the Song of the Lord, occurring within the vast composition that's the Mahabharata. It's a conversation between a soldier, a, a warrior, who is unsure whether he should take back part in a bloody battle to come. And his charioteer, who counsels him and asks him to act in accordance with his dharma, his duties. This charioteer goes through a series of arguments about the nature of the self, about the nature of the world, about how we should act. But in the climax of the 11th chapter of 18 chapters of short verses, this charioteer, Krishna, reveals himself as the ultimate God, the God who encompasses all the gods, all the world, all the human beings, all that was past, present and future, stands outside time, whose time grown old and to whom all things return because it was from him that all things have come. This Krishna gives an assurance that by devotion to him alone and by surrendering to him, any human being will be able to find freedom from the suffering of life. 
By about the 7th and 8th century, the Gita's adroit combination of narrative and philosophical exploration has become the driving force for uh, the development of what we might think of as Hindu theology. But in the meantime, there has been a debate about whether to even think of a god or indeed gods. First of all, you have the Buddhists saying that since the ultimate truths are taught by a man who realized the truths, i.e. the Buddha, the sacred word arises from this insightful human being and not from a god. So you already start having, before the full development of Hindu theology, arguments against a Hindu god. But more interestingly, by the 6th century, these orthodox interpreters of the Vedas you were mentioning, especially a thinker called Kumarila, wants clearly to resist the growth of this um, popular devotional narrative view of gods and what he sees in a way as a threat to the ritual purity of the Vedas. So he says all these gods that you hear mention, the fire and the wind and the king of the gods and, um, and the sun and so forth, they're not really gods. They're not actual beings intervening with superhuman powers. They are simply the Vedas' way of focusing your attention on the ideas they represent. So Kumarila is really trying to say, let's not have any truck with this popular way of thinking about these deities. They are simply abstractions for ritual. But he's also, in a way, almost joining with the Buddhists in saying there is no need for a single god, a god who might have authored the texts. And it's very interesting because in other places, Kumarila does talk about Krishna in very respectful ways. He uses Krishna's life as illustrative of particular kinds of religious goals. However, without mentioning any particular form of the ultimate God, he says, there is no need for a God if you think the God, a God is needed to establish a sacred text. And he has a whole series of arguments, perhaps the most important one of which is an argument about circularity. He says, where do you get the idea of a God? From the sacred text. Why is the text sacred? Because it came from God. So which comes first? Are you committed to a God? Or are you committed to the text? Well, it could be from God's own revelation. Since you weren't there at the time God was, and when you see a claim being made by an entity, how do you know that the one claiming to be God is God? If you already had the knowledge, you would have no need of God. If you don't have that knowledge, how do you know that the one who's telling you these things is a God? So he makes a series of moves like that to say that either with the case of these many deities or with the case of an ultimate God who is the creator of the texts and of the world, the arguments don't fly. And what you're left with is a self-revelation of the structure of the cosmos and the injunctions to ritual action that the Vedas have. So what happens is that, in a way, what we think of in the West is philosophy of religion which is arguments for the existence of God, have to struggle in this latter half of the first millennium of the common era against the kind of arguments that the Buddhists are giving, but more lethally that Kumarila is giving. Some philosophers, of uh, traditional theistic philosophers of religion, of a system called Nyaya, do keep on trying to say that there are actually arguments and they give arguments that in the West, we are relatively um, sort of used to thinking about teleological arguments, cosmological arguments, arguments against uh, the problem of evil and so forth. But the philosophy of religion in Hinduism as a systematic argument struggles against Kumarila in a way that is disorienting in the West, where we think of atheism, the arguments against the existence of God, as coming in early modernity 
against a 1,500-year tradition of arguments for God. Whereas here you have somebody relatively early, that is by the 6th or 7th century, already saying there are real problems with arguing for the existence of God and the philosophers of religion trying to come back against it. This difficulty with Kumarila's arguments in a way inaugurates what we might think of as theological reasoning, because the ones who are committed, the thinkers who come from about the 8th, 9th, 10th century onwards, in a way implicitly accept that the issue of human relationship with God is not epistemological. If you are dependent on proving the existence of God in order to live a, a, a life of devotion, then what kind of devotion is that? You could ask for the proof of somebody's capacities if it's another human being. Do we need to follow them? Is that a good teacher? Is that a you know, good leader? But with God, surely your uh, devotion cannot be so impoverished. It requires argument. And so in a way, they're giving in to the power of Kumarila's arguments and those of others who came after him and basically saying by the 10th, 11th century that the important questions about God are to do with the nature of faith, with the nature of seeking understanding through faith, through love for God who one is sure, as Krishna said in the Bhagavad Gita, is going to bestow us with grace when we surrender to that God. So in the subsequent centuries, from about the 10th, 11th century onwards, you see almost Hindus, Hindu thinkers, committing themselves to theological reasoning, understanding within faith, rather than an epistemological enterprise trying to prove such a God exists. The developmental history is fascinating, especially as it articulates with what we're used to in uh, Judeo-Christian thinking. Uh, but I, I want to ask how much of that was motivated uh, by the Buddhist tradition, which also, of course, emerged uh, on the Indian subcontinent. Uh, you, you have an interesting paper, which I enjoyed, against the Hindu a god from Buddhist philosophy of religion in India. So. Uh, did those Buddhist arguments or critiques, was that the ultimate motivation? And then the Hindu responses came to that? Or was it also uh, um, a, a rise within the Hindu tradition itself? So the only Hindu philosophical system that is concerned to argue uh, philosophically for a god is the Nyaya system that I mentioned. And the Nyaya uh, philosophers do take, take themselves to be arguing against the Buddhist denial of God. So re relative to that, Kumarila is really disorienting because he's saying he is the most orthodox exegete of the most sacred texts, the Vedas, and in a sense, he agrees with the, Buddha, with the Buddhists. He thinks, actually, fundamentally, the Buddhists and the Nyaya philosophers are both wrong because both of them are committed to texts being composed by an author. The Buddhists say it's a human being who had this extraordinary realization. The Nyaya philosophers say, actually, it's God. But Kumarila says, you're both wrong. The sacred text, the Vedas, are a self-revelation. Any author will take you down that vicious cycle of who you, what you rely on first, the author or the text. As far as the what I was calling the theological development is concerned, there are by the 13th and 14th centuries thinkers within particular systems like Vaishnavism, Sri Vaishnavism, which is a mode of uh, thinking theologically which takes God to be uh, the uh, combination of God Vishnu and his consort Sri, who is uh, God's grace. The Sri Vaishnavas do sometimes refer back to the Buddhist arguments against the existence of God. But by this time, Buddhism has ceased to have any kind of a presence in the subcontinent, in South Asia. It has moved on to Tibet and China and to Sri Lanka and East Southeast Asia. 
but not in India anymore as an active participant in the debates in Sanskrit. But they are nevertheless using that argument as a way of uh, making the moves to say that actually, even if we cannot prove the existence of God, the arguments by the Buddhists against God don't work. So you have, therefore, this position. There's relatively little direct argument against the Buddhist arguments against the existence of God. That is to say, by the Nyaya philosophers. And that is just one slice of the debates that are going on at that time and subsequently. In all the conversations, uh, how is the question of that the different traditions, the different religions, do they, is everybody worshiping the same God? Uh, this is obviously a, a, an important um, uh, geopolitical question in today's world because of the tension, but from a strictly theological, philosophical point of view, how do the different traditions, Hinduism, indeed Buddhism or Jainism, uh, how, how do they address that question? Do all religions worship the same God? Well, to start with, Buddhism and Jainism do not have a, a, a God in their explanatory system. Uh, both of them simply say that there are particular ways of living life or indeed a cycle of lives in order to purify oneself of the suffering that is the existential condition of living and that the method of doing so has is taught by Mahavira, who's the most uh, important figure in Jainism, or by uh, Gautama Buddha. So both of them are very, very clear that when it comes to a god as an ultimate uh, being or ultimate god beyond being, there is no such thing. Now, what happens in uh, Jainism is that there is a very complex uh, myth or history they have in which Mahavira is the last of 24 uh, people who conquered, had the spiritual conquest of the conditions of the world. So they call the Jinas. And they are, as it were, worshipped because it is they who guide human beings. With Buddhism, there is a sharp divergence in the Theravada systems. The Buddha is the teacher. He's the Das Gon. He did this he demonstrated it and he gained his nirvana, freedom from the conditions of, of, of existence, leaving behind teachings for life. And those are the way, things that we must adhere to in going through successive lives until we are also free. The other stream, mainstream, Mahayana Buddhism, which spreads especially into Tibet and East Asia, also does not have an ultimate God. However, there is a proliferation of um, superhuman beings, not only the Buddha in previous lives, but also other Buddhas, but also those who were advanced on the path of the Buddha called the Bodhisattvas. So between a set of Buddhas and a set of Bodhisattvas, you have beings who have gone far beyond what human beings like us have. So they function like deities. They are worshipped and their guidance is sought in small things as much as in ultimate things. But technically, they are all beings on the path to or having attained nirvana, not eternal entities like gods. So, of course, it is interesting that some of the functions of these Buddhas and Bodhisattvas mirror, develop, interact with some of the deities in the Hindu pantheon. But their ultimate role is different. When you turn to the Hindu traditions, actually, there is no way of finding one form or one theological system that all adhere to. There are systems in which a commitment to a particular text, a particular way of thinking about God, is seen as the most correct, the one that truly uh, 
should define our lives, a God who is truly to be worshipped. But even those communities and systems of thought do not say that everyone else is in error. They simply tend to say they are partial in their insights. But for most Hindus, the idea throughout many, many centuries has been that there are particular ways in which the divine becomes accessible to us. And that can take an infinite number of forms as uh, there are any number of human beings and infinite is our spiritual wants. So the question of whether therefore all these are forms of a single divine or not is usually deferred, eternally deferred, because God becomes accessible through name and form and qualities of engagement. And that form and name that you worship in your limited capacity is all you have of divine grace. So although there are philosophers who do try and give, in a way, a reductive explanation which says all these manifestations are actually of one God, the Gita itself says that Krishna reveals himself as containing all the other deities. In practice, it has been much, much less clear. It's only in modernity, in the face of especially challenges from Christian uh, missionaries and thinkers, that Hindus have begun to say, actually, the best way to understand this um, irreducible plur pluralism of name and form and worship is to think ultimately they're all unified in the divine. And, and the concept of Brahman, going back to the Upanishads, is often used as a placeholder. It is from that Brahman, which is beyond our understanding, that these forms become understandable. So that's the way in which, retrospectively, in a way, Hindus find that unity. If you go back into the traditions, you don't find a single unity like that. The Sri Vaishnavas, for example, talk about a God beyond being a God beyond Brahman. Brahman is simply the philosophical ultimate. God is even beyond that. And that is the God who comes to be loved by us and about whom um, hymns are written, who, who structures our emotions. So actually, when you look at the diversity of Hindu thought, of course, there are ways of trying to unify them. But perhaps the true genius of the Hindu traditions is to realize that any move you make, whether to accept the plurality or to claim a unity, is already part of the human need to explain, best simply to accept the love of God. So the superficial feeling that many people in the West would have about Hinduism, that Hinduism is a polytheistic religion, is, is uh, not just an oversimplification, but a misunderstanding of the sophistication of thinking between the pluralistic ideas and the single force or ground of being uh, underneath it all. Yes. I think what Hinduism does is to open up um, the contingency of uh, the particular experience of Western Christianity. If you ask Christians in India, they are going to have a different relationship to the Hindu traditions. So I think it is a call to sympathy, to sensitivity, and to decentering what we think is right. Hmm. So let's talk about the specific traits or attributes that God or deities would have within Hinduism. And how do these traits or attributes articulate with those that the classic Abrahamic God would have? Um, and, and can you compare Vishnu as the supreme being, as you've said, in, in Vaishnavism, uh, with the perfect being theology or God in the Ju Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, who is, you know, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipotent, all benevolent, morally perfect, all of those omni-characteristic. How does the Hindu God articulate with that? Well, um, not straightforwardly. There are, of course, um, theologians who do think of Vishnu or indeed Shiva in some ways as um, 
the supreme being. But there is also, as in Western thought, uh, since at least uh, Aquinas, a really probing concern about being itself. I have mentioned this before, the idea that being is our way of understanding existence as we find ourselves. To think of God as the supreme being is to be limited by our conceptions of supremacy. So I have argued in the past that Sri Vaishnavism really rests on a God beyond being in a way in which uh, some Catholic theologians in the last 30 or 40 years have begun to look back on Aquinas and argue for. So what we must remember all the time is there isn't one kind of Christian idea. So the idea of God as omnibenevolent, omnipotent, these are things that are seriously questioned in terms of our understanding, in terms of how we close off um, what God means. There might be a God for the devout from particular kinds of uh, church catechisms, perhaps. But many Christian theologians bring a lot of a severe pressure to bear on many of these kinds of routine aspects of what God is supposed to be. So I, I would start by saying that there isn't an idea of what a Christian God is in any case, um, much less so with um, the notion of God in the Hindu traditions. So we must start with that reflective uh, point about diversity, even in the Christian traditions. After that, yes, you're going to find a different way of relating um, narrative and theology. Obviously, the Christian narrative has to deal with a particular set of events in the Bible. Hindu traditions think of narrative in a far more pluralistic way, even with Sri Vaishnavism. Never mind other forms of Vaishnavism, other forms of worship, of other conceptions of God as divine. These narratives, because they are endlessly proliferating, they play a different role in relation to theology. Where in Christian thought, theology becomes a way of becoming coherent with a particular narrative that is relatively stable and agreed upon, in Hindu thought, there is a constant dialectic between what narratives are saying about the divine and what theological ideas of the divine are found there. So you might have almost competing ideas about does is God beyond feeling? Is God with feeling? Is God in with form? Is God beyond form? All of these different kinds of um, conceptions of the divine are found there. So they're different from Christianity in the negative sense that they obviously do not cohere to a single narrative from which theology emerges as in the Christian tradition. But beyond that, you're not going to find in Christianity itself sufficient stability on what theologies of God talk about. And therefore, it becomes even more difficult when you look at the wide range of Hindu thought to say, is the Hindu God like a Christian God? Mm. So in Christianity, we have a long tradition of argument about whether God is, a, in, in an ultimate sense, a person with personhood features like awareness, intent, will. Some aspects of Christianity talk about uh, a ground of being or beyond being uh, that is the real God and the personal, the personal thing is just a way of communicating to humans. And others, uh, perhaps more recently, uh, believe that God, the ultimate being, is a real person in the personhood sense. Is this, is this argument uh, also within the Hindu tradition? That's right. Uh, certainly in most Hindu traditions, there is a dialectic between thinking of God as this ultimate ground of being, Brahman, uh, as that from which all name and form 
uh, and qualities emerge to become accessible to us versus the argument that flips that around and says that the very ground of being is a mere uh, metaphysical enterprise based on the capacities of the human imagination. The God that is revealed in the sacred text or in the Gita, for example, is a God that escapes anything that we may conceive of, but presents to us as this being, as Vishnu, or in other texts as Shiva, or as Devi, the goddess. So there is the dialectic between those two. And some, and many of the Hindu theological traditions try and find a balance between them to say that you can think of the divine both as qualityed, Satguna Brahman, God with qualities, or Brahman Nirguna, without qualities. So they try and say that these are two ways of God becoming accessible to us. But other traditions might unequivocally reject the, uh, the, the, the sort of metaphysical God in favor of this God who is love, who is, person, who is a person of love and grace. However, we must also keep in mind that a lot turns on what we think a person to be. So one of the things we find is that in 20th century Christian uh, devotional theology, which talks of God as person, much also turns on what the person is, because there is a huge uh, literature on the conception of personhood. So too with the Hindu systems. If you're going to say God is a person, a purusha, what do you mean by that? It's not self-evident. So again, there is a relationship between the philosophical thinking of a person and the thinking of God as person. A small example. Tradition Kumarila says, if God is a person, you need a body. If there is a body, there must be desires. If there is desire, then that God is not plenitude, is not completely fulfilled or satisfied. What kind of a God is it? So you've got to be very careful if you're going to talk about a God as a person. If, on the other hand, you say God is not bodied, then where do the qualities reside? One of the systematic uh, questions that many of the Hindu systems have is how can you have a God who has qualities of love and compassion and justice and so on, and yet not take no name and form. What kind of a metaphysics allows us to even conceive of personhood, but without what normally constitutes the lexical definition of a person, i.e. bodied presence? So these are really complex questions about the nature of personhood. And I think there's a very close connection in both the Hindu systems and in um, Christian thought about the philosophical questions of personhood and the theological question of whether to think of God as person or not. Let's talk about the relationship between consciousness and theism. Uh, in Western religions, it, it's actually very simple that God is the ultimate and God created consciousness and not much discussion. My sense is that in the Hindu traditions, indeed in many of the uh, major religions from from uh, the Indian subcontinent, that consciousness is more primordial or, or fundamental uh, than, than that. And if so, if consciousness is fundamental and primordial, what is its relationship with the divine? Right. Well, of course, even in Christian thought, um, God possesses consciousness. God is not inert. So you have to uh, derive uh, our idea, our consciousness from the divine consciousness, although we understand divine consciousness only because we are conscious, thereby making the divine dependent in a way upon our understanding. So there's always that problem with where to locate our understanding of consciousness. Now, there are two or three different directions in which the question of consciousness goes in Hindu thought. So going back to the Upanishads and the concept of Brahman, one of the early articulations of the idea of Brahman is that Brahman is uh, characterized 
as Sat Chit Ananda, which means by being um, consciousness and bliss. And of course, a huge number of philosophical divergences happen from about the ninth, eighth, ninth century onwards in looking back at the Upanishads and saying, how, what do we mean by that? Is Brahman beyond qualities? Are these qualities? If they are qualities, how are they found? So can't go into that too de in too detail. But this notion of consciousness right from the beginning becomes very central. In future, the project is going to be talking about que questions of self. In the Upanishads, you have this very early identification between what is essential to the inquirer called Atman, initially meaning breath, but coming to mean self, and what is Brahman. Therefore, the identity of some sort, again, the nature of that identity is much disputed by different um, commentators on the Upanishads, that identity is through consciousness. So that inquiring entity, that presence that is here, that is even asking the question, what is reality? What is truth? What is there ultimately? Why is anything there? It is doing so because it is conscious. And that consciousness is in some way not different from the consciousness of Brahman. So right from the beginning, the idea becomes that that, that consciousness is an explanatory principle of existence. This can go in different ways. It can be seen as, in a way, encompassing theology. So in the famous 8th century thinker Shankara, who um, taught the idea of non-dualism, non-dualism is the non-difference between all the plurality of the world, the material world, the individual beings, everything that exists, the non-duality of that, and the single absolute principle of Brahman. So there, Shankara said, even the idea of God, or indeed the gods, they are all part of our capacity to project our understanding of consciousness. But ultimately, they're all not different from this principle, this absolute principle called Brahman. So in a way, he reread the theologies back into this, what we might say, trans-metaphysics. That is, the Brahman that is the ground of everything else. So in a very strange, neat reversal of all theologies, he says, theology holds, notion of God holds, but only provisionally, because ultimately God is something that individual human beings think of, project, but ultimately upon realizing our non-difference with the absolute, even the idea of God, even the idea of religion and devotion and worship, they all are provisional. They are all penultimate. So that's a very provocative idea. I'm trying to... I'm trying to tease apart the approach uh, 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 in traditional Christian philosophy of religion from Hindu philosophy of religion relating to consciousness. And uh, if I can put it this way, maybe to exaggerate, that in the Christian tradition, the understanding is that God is um, uh, completely independent as society and, and, and has independence and consciousness is a a reflection of that. Whereas in the Hindu philosophy of religion, as you've just described, it sounds like consciousness is what's primordial. And in a sense, God is a representation or an expression of consciousness. Is that, that the is, distinction? Yeah, that talking? is only in Advaita. So there is no single way of talking about Hindu <laughs> uh, ideas. This is the system of Advaita. In the system of Dvaita, dualism, which was espoused by somebody called Madhva in the 12th, in the 13th century. In fact, there is a rigorous distinction, an ultimate distinction between God and everything else, including all conscious beings. So in a, in a, in a different part of Hindu thought, you do have 
a very strict difference. The, du the dualism, the Dvaitha that Madhva talks about is the utter dualism between God and, create, and all other uh, reality and a further difference between the material reality and the conscious reality that is um, living creatures, including human beings. So we can't draw a single uh, distinction, although we must also keep in mind that if you're talking about a Christian characterization as you did, well, that wouldn't hold when we're talking of Bishop George Barclay. So Barclay, the world is um, in God's mind, is a thought of God's mind. So as I keep saying, we, don't, we can't even find something that Christians agree on. We're certainly not going to find enough to then draw distinction with what Hindus talk about, because different Hindu systems can say radically different things. And even the idea of consciousness as the ultimate reality in Shankara, in Advaita, is again different from the views of um, a, a, a school called Kashmiri Shaivism, or it's called the school of recognition. It worships Shiva. Now, what this does is something which is more comparable to what contemporary panpsychists are talking about. Whereas in Advaita, the world and our individuality is all reducible ultimately to this ground consciousness of Brahman. For the Kashmiri Shaivas, everything is consciousness, including the material world. So it's not like everything is reducible to consciousness, but rather that consciousness is what is, is the word to apply for all of reality, all of which is encompassed by Shiva. So when you talk about the reality of the external world, where the Advaita philosophers would say, well, it's real up to a point that explains experience, but ultimately we go beyond its uh, physicality, its materiality, and find that to be part of consciousness, the Kashmiri Shaivas would say, oh yes, the material is also conscious. It's not that we don't think that there are material, non-material things, but we must rework our understanding of what is material and non-material in terms of consciousness. That comes very close to what some contemporary panpsychists are talking about, except in a theological way, where contemporary panpsychists want to say that it is a view of uh, physics that panpsychism encompasses material materialism. And for the Kashmiri Shaivas, panpsychism is a theological position. And again, therefore, it's very different from either the non-dualists or the dualists. Mm -hmm. And I haven't even begun to talk about how the Sri Vaishnavas talk about it or a host of other systems. So given the metaphysical diversity within Indian philosophy of religion, how do you respond to what we have as a fundamental leitmotif question for Closer to Truth, what exists? In other words, what are the fundamental non-reducible categories of reality? What is ultimate reality? Well, again, I cannot give you a single answer. Uh, so the different traditions are going to say different things. Either everything is the single principle of Brahman, which might or might not be God, or it could be consciousness, which might or might not be God. There might be a multitude of physical entities encompassed by a creator God. So we have literally the entire range of human experience encompassed by the Hindu traditions with their diverse answers on what ultimately exists. And each of them has to be treated on its own merits. Could you compare and contrast Hindu and Buddhist metaphysics? Uh, no, because we have any number of Hindu metaphysical systems and any number of Buddhist metaphysical systems. So again, it's and really they, difficult to and find. And they both cover all the alternatives. You, you have a huge range, that's right. So I think mm. one thing that might happen is that the dominant Indian philosophical debates in the first millennium were between those Buddhists of the Mahayana system who said that either we were never going to be able to find an answer to what exists and therefore we must rest on what they called emptiness, or we have a dialectic between the subjective and the objective 
both of which must be dissolved away. Those were the two major Buddhist views. Mm. And on the other side, you had the Hindu views of either non-dualism or different forms of uh, realisms or pluralisms. So these were some of the dominant debates for maybe seven or 800 years, when at least there were relatively clear positions of debate between Hindu and Buddhist systems. Beyond that, we have to look at particular questions. Do we have a, a unitary self or is there just a, a flow of consciousness? What are the means of knowledge? How do we play, uh, deny or affirm the reality of the external world? So it all devolves down to particular debates in which particular systems held very specific views and argued for them. So we can't have a reductive Hindu-Buddhist comparison. But still, there seems to be a predilection in both traditions for non-realism or denial of materiality, more so than in Western traditions. No, because the Nyaya philosophers, the Dvaita philosophers, uh, the Kumarila, they were all very much metaphysical realists and pluralists. They were absolutely committed to an infinite diversity of things, material and non-material. Well, this has been terrific, Ram. I really appreciate it. I look forward to further conversations. Unfortunately, we're limited by time, but uh, my knowledge of uh, Hindu philosophy of religion has materially increased. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you.